Hello and welcome back to the channel. It's a Lit Life with Miranda Reads and today we're talking about my cottage core book recommendations. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the cottage core aesthetic, it's essentially your grandmother's style, but cool. For this style, clothing tends to be floral and flowy, colors are pastel or muted, accessories are handmade and simple. There's a lot of emphasis on hobbies like embroidery, from scratch baking, foraging, gardening, canning, etc. Personally, I've loved the cottage core aesthetic for going on a decade now and I've been collecting books that reflect that for years. And today, I am beyond excited to share them with you. So let's get started. The first batch of books are the ones I call my children's cottagecore. These are gorgeously illustrated books with simplistic, wholesome storylines. These are the ones I read over and over, both as a child and now because there's just something so quintessentially appealing about the art style and the storylines. Now whenever I think of children's cottagecore, my mind first goes to the tales of Peter Rabbit. This series began in 1902 by English writer Beatrix Potter who had a pet rabbit by the same name. In Peter's first story, he is a naughty rabbit and tries to steal vegetables from Mr. McGregor's garden and is very nearly caught. From there, the series follows more adventures of Peter Rabbit and then expands into a wide cast of characters, from Squirrel Nutkin to Mrs. Tiggywinkle the Hedgehog. This is truly one of my favorite children's books and the soft colors and beautifully hand-painted illustrations it just feels like the perfect cottage core book. The next one that reminds me of this aesthetic is Winnie the Pooh. Now this series was written by A.A. A. Milne and it was first published in the 1920s. It follows a teddy bear named Winnie the Pooh who goes on adventures with his various animal friends and the human boy Christopher Robin. Most of the characters in the series are actually based off of toys that belong to the author's son who is also called Christopher Robin. Winnie the Pooh in this series adores honey, mischief, and mayhem, which, lucky for him, there's plenty of it in the Hundred Acre Woods. And finally, there's the Complete Brambly Hedge series by Jill Barklin. Jill was a British writer and illustrator who is most known for her stories revolving around a little mouse village set within Brambly Hedge. Her stories were first published in the 1980s, and her first four books each follow a different season, and from there we have four other stories that are a little bit more adventurous. What I love about these books is the attention to detail. The author was so incredibly careful about all the plants and animals in her stories, making sure that they were true to their nature counterpart and even within season. Oh, and then also the little mouse houses are just so adorable and crammed with so much detail. I love them. Moving right along, we have our middle grade cottagecore books. Now these are ones are a step above children's, but they're no less charming. The four I've chosen are my Barnes & Noble collectible editions of Heidi, Anne of Green Gables, The Secret Garden, and Wind in the Willows. All of these books were written quite a while ago, but they hold up so well with time that they are worth a reread. Heidi was written by the Swiss author Johanna Spyri in 1881, and it's one of the most famous classic children's stories from Switzerland. It begins with a recently orphaned Heidi who is sent to live with her grandfather in the Alps. And at first, he truly is the most curmudgeonly of curmudgeons out there. But soon her charming, cheerful, and loving demeanor wins him over. Now this one does probably have the most significant religious tilt of the books I'm recommending today, but I also think it's really interesting just to hear what it was like to live in those times. Plus, I love Heidi's perspective and the goats are just far too cute. The next one is Anne of Green Gables, and the first book was written by L. M. Montgomery in the early 1900s. This is set on Prince Edward Island in Canada. Matthew and Marilla Cuthbert of Green Gables send for a boy to help out on the farm, but much to their surprise, red-headed and orphaned Anne is dropped off instead. Her imagination, whimsical ways, and loving heart soon wins over the old couple, and just like that, Anne gets what she's always wanted, a family. But the adventure isn't over yet. There's hair tie fiascos, adventures in the haunted wood, and more. One thing I love about this series is just the sheer volume of hijinks that she gets into. 
And quite unsurprisingly at this point, the next book on this list also follows an orphan, <laughs> this time named Mary. The Secret Garden by Frances Hodges Burnett is set on the English moor in the early 1900s. The orphan Mary is sent to live with a distant uncle and she's miserable and completely unloved until she finds a very neglected garden. Soon she pours love into this garden and surprisingly finds out what it's like to be loved as well. This one fits the cottagecore aesthetic, not just because of the gorgeous setting and time period, but also the attention to details regarding the botanicals. Now the final one does not have an orphan. I know, I know, breaking the mold here. The Wind in the Willows was written in 1908 by Kenneth Graham, and it's set along a river in England. We follow four main animals, mole, rat, toad, and badger, as they go on various adventures together. This one is a bit more fast paced than the rest, but I truly love the way the animals interact with each other and their environment. And finally, we have the adult cottagecore books. And apologies, the covers aren't all matchy matchy like my previous ones. And I do wanna clarify by adult, I don't mean adult, adult. I just mean the target audience just typically isn't young children. The first one is A Girl of Limber Lost. This book centers around Elnora and she is a poor girl from the early 1900s who is neglected by her mother and then turns to the Limber Lost Swamp in rural Indiana where she collects and preserves moths to try and find a way to pull herself out of poverty and into a new life. The connection with nature in this one is what draws me to this book time and time again. It makes me want to find a limber lost of my own to become lost in. From there, I would recommend Little Woman by Louise May Alcott. This book centers on four March sisters, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy, who live in Massachusetts in the late 1800s. We follow the sisters over the course of a few years as they transition from childhood to becoming, well, <laughs> little women. There's a lot of emphasis from food, crafts, and entertainment from the 1860s and it's a semi-autobiographical book about the author's own experience growing up with her three sisters. And of course, it would be an absolute travesty if I didn't include Little House on the Prairie series. Technically, this one is a children's to middle grade book, but it works so well with a reread that I am bumping it up a few levels in the hopes that more adults revisit this classic. This series is based off of the real Lori Ingalls Wilder's life starting around five years old and spanning until she gets married. This is a truly delightful story about a family trying to live and make it on the prairie all by themselves. It's all about self-sufficiency, love, and family. There's a ton of really neat crafts that have been made based off of this book over the years as well. Now, if we want a few more modern books, there's definitely the Jane Austen Society, which is set just after World War II, where we follow a set of Austen fans as they try to preserve the late author's home and legacy in England. There's also World of Wonders, which is a gorgeous memoir that takes essays about the author's life and intersperses them with moments from the natural world. The illustrations in this one are absolutely top-notch and provide a wonderful connection to the flora and fauna surrounding us. And the most recent one is the one that went viral, 101 poems written by a 96-year-old Scottish author. The topics of these poems range from love to religion to lighthearted to absurd to loss. And I really feel like we get to know the author in this one and it truly gives me cottagecore vibes. And before I move on, I of course have to mention the birds and the bees. The birds, of course, referring to the wonderful set of illustrated books by Matt Sewell. He is known for these lovely hand-illustrated drawings of all sorts of birds, along with his unique and lighthearted take on their species. He is absolutely hilarious, and I adore reading every book he's written. And then there's also The Little Book of Bees, which is an illustrated guide to the secret lives that bees live. The art in this one is unbelievable. <laughs> and the book teaches you all about the different species of bees that exist around the world, the importance of honey, and how to begin beekeeping on your own. This is one of those books where you can truly tell that the author loves the subject with her whole heart. And the last set of books that I would like to recommend are my cookbooks. One of Cottage Core's core values is self-sufficiency and relearning lost skills, like cooking. 
and I have been on the lookout for old style cottagecore cookbooks for a while now. And these ones are my absolute favorites. I have three levels of cookbooks, comfort, moderate, and challenging. The first one I'd recommend is the Tasha Tudor family cookbook. Tasha Tudor is an American illustrator and writer who has nearly a hundred books under her belt, beginning in 1938 up until 2003. This cookbook is actually written by her grandson and includes many of the recipes that he knows and loves, along with snippets of her life. The recipes tend not to be flashy, they often match with familiar recipes if you grew up in the United States, but at the same time, its simplicity and honesty when it comes to food it really drew me to it in the first place. The next one I'd recommend is the Old Farmer's Almanac Cookbook. If you're unfamiliar, the Old Farmer's Almanac has been in continuous publication since 1818. It contains sections on the weather, growing seasons, gardening advice, fashion trends, along with recipes for you to try at home. The two almanac cookbooks contain recipes submitted over the years, and I would, I would classify these ones as moderate. There's mostly recipes that are familiar, but it does give quite a few challenges to boom. If you had to choose between these two, I would lean towards the garden one. The Everyday Cookbook has a lot of fun recipes, but the layout and pictures do feel a bit dated. The Garden Cookbook is bursting with color and fun, and the recipes have a heavy farm-to-table emphasis, which is truly delightful when you're cooking. And finally, there's the Beatrix Potter Country Cookbook. This is the same author as the Peter Rabbit one mentioned earlier, and this cookbook has a rather unique approach to the author's life and legacy. Each recipe mentioned is something that Beatrix Potter loved or had likely eaten in her lifetime, based off of the time period. And as a result, the recipes in here are a bit more niche, and I would say it's also a little bit more challenging because it often requires ingredients and techniques and tastes that might be a little bit unusual to modern era. And yet, I absolutely adore the snippets into her life through the foods that she knew and loved. Cooking from the challenging book is a fabulous way to immerse yourself into new and exciting culinary adventures. Whew. I think I hit over 20 recommendations for you all, and I hope that you enjoy some, if not all, of these gorgeous books. If you have any recommendations when it comes to cottagecore books, I would absolutely love to hear them. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Happy reading! Bye!